I want to tell you about someone this morning that maybe many of you have never met because you've not heard of him. But he's got a compelling life that's worth sharing briefly with you this morning. His name is George Mueller. He was born in Germany in 1805. From early on in life, he was not a very honest or good person. He was known in his earliest years of childhood when he had increasing freedom to be a thief. He would steal from different people starting at 10 years of age, and then he would begin to steal first from his father and then his friends. This life of criminal activity progressed so much so that he finally was arrested, put in jail with other thieves. He did, though, thankfully get out after serving some time in prison at a young age, and eventually, surprisingly, went to college. It was while he was at college, some of you even know this from your days of when you were in college, starting as somebody who was not in Christ, did not know the gospel, he met a friend who invited him to a Bible study. And that Bible study was captivating for him. In that study of God's Word, they talked about a loving God who would forgive sins. George Mueller knew of sins. He had committed many. He had paid the price in the criminal system for some of them. But he knew that there were others that had not been paid for. His heart was touched and he understood the gospel that he could be forgiven because of faith in Christ and faith alone in Christ alone. Not faith plus his pledge to never do bad things again, but trusting in Christ. As a result of this new life in Christ, he had the opportunity to teach German to some Americans while at college. It was how he paid for his time in college he continued to study the Bible, though, while in college, he began to preach. He loved what he was learning. He wanted other people to know it themselves. As a result of that, after he finished college, he was asked to be a pastor of a small church of about 18 people. He enjoyed it, but he had a compassionate heart, love for people, desired to help them and take whatever God had given him, knowledge or capacity or even money, and share it with others. He was asked by a friend to move to Bristol, England, a country he did not live in. But in Bristol, England, he wanted to go there because there was a port town and there was lots of problems with orphans. So many young children with neither mother nor father lived on the streets. Orphans had no one to care for them and had to beg or steal food to survive. And people commonly had no pity on them. They were irritated by these orphan children. The government knew it was a problem, so the way that they helped the orphans is they'd put them in workhouses to basically work in the factories. There were no child labor laws to protect the children back then. Mueller began to pray about starting an orphan house for these orphans. But he didn't want to ask for money from people. He wanted to ask God, God, would you move in the hearts of people to see this need? Would you use me to help that? And over time, it began to happen. Money began to be given to George as he had laid, learned of his passion to help the orphans. And as a result of this, he began to begin an orphanage, starting first with 30 girls. Started an orphanage just for the girls. And then he opened a second home and a third home. He spent hours every day studying the Bible and praying. He felt God was calling him to care for even more orphans. And so after a consecutive time of prayer, over spanning over five weeks of time of praying, he believed that God wanted him to build a large facility. He knew it would be expensive. He knew he had no money. At that time, it would have cost $18,000. That didn't sound like a lot to maybe a lot of you, but by comparison, that would be saying today, we want to start a brand new building that costs a million dollars. And God provided as the years went by and all the orphanages he began and all the ways he began to serve and help others, the time came where the Lord called George home. March 10th, 1898, at the age of 92, George Mueller passed away. Thousands of people lined the streets to honor him, Christians and non-Christians. 2,000 orphans alone were in attendance to honor the man who saw them when the rest of society did not and by God's grace helped provide for them. 
not just food and shelter, but in all their orphanages were known for teaching them a trade so that they could one day themselves be able to provide for themselves and others. In addition to caring for orphans, George Mueller also paid for the printing of Bibles and tracts. He gave away in his lifetime over 250,000 Bibles. He paid tuition for hundreds of children to go to school. During his lifetime, he raised what would be the equivalent today of $129 million, all of which was to give away for the care of others. When he died, he had very little money, but enough that started a trust to care for those who he had left behind. The records of that show that there are nearly 18,000 children that were cared for during the 150-year life of that orphanage. Now, why do I share that? What does George Mueller have to do and what we have to do with you and me today? Well, number one, I think it's always great to introduce people to good biographies, good stories of men and women that just kind of help us lift our head up from the daily grind of living here in South Florida in 2024. But secondly, because Mueller lived every day with the pressing reality of the following. God, how am I going to feed these kids? See, the part you don't know about George Mueller is he never once directly asked anybody for money to feed the orphans. He just prayed. And many times in which he would pray the prayer, he would be praying for the food that had not yet been provided. And when the prayer was done, there would be a knock on the door Someone saying, hey, I had this. I wanted to provide this for you. He would say, thank the Lord. I say this because it'll make the following quote more meaningful as it applies to our understanding. George Mueller said, where faith begins, anxiety ends. Where anxiety ends, faith begins. I'll use that quote from George Mueller today to be the main point of today's message by understanding. Where faith begins, anxiety ends. Where anxiety ends, faith begins. If you were with us last week, you know that we started a series on the topic of anxiety, something that's common to all of us in some form or fashion, in some way or another, in some point or another, in some time or another, it has come, it is here now, or it will come for us. And the question is, what are we supposed to do with this in light of that? Does God understand us and does he care about us? Let me just remind you, for those of you who were here last week and bring others of you along, having missed last week, what we learned is this is another installment. We have understood what anxiety is. We gave a definition of it to, to see the reality of it. We met anxiety in a sidekick. Secondly, we learned about people in the Bible who knew about anxiety. Even this past week, a number of our community groups who are studying through 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, read of Hannah and saw what she did with her anxiety, how she took her to the Lord in prayer. And how even before the prayer was answered, when she left, she was relieved. Not because the problem was immediately gone, because the problem was placed where it should be, at the feet of her God, who she knew cared. And then last week, we began to learn what I titled the seven truths that are meant to help us defeat our anxiety and worry. And this comes back to Matthew chapter six. So let me ask you to turn your Bibles back to Matthew chapter six. To just briefly summarize the first four, we'll get to the next three and then we're gonna launch into some other sections together. Look at this with me here. First of all, Jesus is teaching, you can never lose the real treasure. Let's look at the text again, Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. Jesus is talking here to the crowd. He says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, fourth time, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." So we saw here Jesus in the previous verses is showing us, number one, you can never lose the real treasure. Number two, life isn't just about outward concerns. And if I may just elaborate on that point, particularly in verse 25, lest you think, well, this is appropriate to say to poor people who worry they would have been poor. They're dependent upon daily provision. They don't have refrigerators like we do. They don't have bank accounts like many of us do. Well, I want you to understand the point of what he's teaching here is that this perspective that he is teaching here in verse 25 about life being more than just outward concerns is a perspective for the rich and the poor. Why? Because it moves people from preoccupation with their own worldly success. How? It discourages the wealthy and the comfortable from concentrating on their own success and the poor and the uncomfortable discouraging them from concentrating on their own misery. The one who has, it's all they think about. The one who has not, it's all they think about. Jesus is saying, you're thinking in the wrong areas. Both have to be taught this. Third thing we learned last week is that God will take care of you. How commonly does God say, your heavenly Father sees knows, provides. Fourth thing we saw last week is anxiety is not going to help you anyway. Verse 27. Anxiety is not going to help you anyway. Meaning, okay, let's just run, let's run the drill. How well is that working for you? Effective? You like it? You like the visits to the doctor? You like the medication? You like the sweaty palms? the perspiration-covered brow, the beating heart. Don't misunderstand me, friend. I don't in any way mean to make light of the condition you feel yourself to be in. I'm just simply trying to have a moment of like logical objectivity and say, how well is anxiety working for you or for me? It turns out, like all other things that promise that they never deliver on, it never actually addresses the problem. It actually creates another problem. Before I go into the final three truths that are meant to help us defend our anxiety and worry, let me help you recognize the following. I want you to think about anxiety in this way. Anxiety is either pushing you or it's pulling you. Anxiety is either pushing you or it's pulling you. It never lets you just stay still and be content. What do I mean by this? Well, let's think about how it's pushing you. It's pushing you with this question. What if? What if? It's pushing you towards the future. Excuse me. It's pulling you towards the future. It pulls you into the future with the possibility of problems. It it keeps interrupting your thoughts with, yeah, but, but what if? It lives and thrives in the land of speculation. It has a vivid imagination. And on the spectrum of possibility versus probability, it thrives on possibility. It could happen. And it sets up shop here. 
plants some stakes in the grounds and a tent is set up. It, 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 it backs up the trailer. It plugs in the generator. It says, we're going to camp here. And its repeating question is, what if? What if? What if? It's pulling you into the future in a horribly destructive way, or it's pushing you. How is it pushing you? It's pushing you from your past with anxiety. It reminds you of what has been, either in your life or someone else's life. It takes the ball pass from shame and guilt, and it dunks on your heart with the question, but, but didn't this happen in your life or somebody else's? Isn't it true that somebody else's spouse cheated on them? How do you know your spouse is not going to cheat on you? Isn't it true that you did this? How do you know that people will find out about you and reject you or God didn't mean all that offer of love for you? Anxiety is either pulling you or pushing you with what if or but didn't this happen? It never leaves you alone and lets you stand still and enjoy where God has you. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to these next three truths from Matthew 6, the text we're in. Number five, Jesus is teaching. God knows exactly what you need. Look back to verse 31. Do not be anxious. And by the way, some of your translations might have the word worry instead of anxious. It's the same Greek word here. It's this, this sort of double-mindedness. Do not be anxious. Do not be worried. Say, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? And he says this following, for the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. Now, this isn't some like racial slur as a Jewish man talking to Jewish people like, don't be like them. He's using a people group assessment to say people who reject God People who reject God, they are living in light of that rejection of God. They have become their own God. They have become their own metaphorical Heavenly Father providing for their own needs. They pull themselves up by their bootstraps, which is why they are relentless with their questions. And yet he says, you have a Heavenly Father. God knows what you need. He is not disconnected, uncaring, aloof but rather a loving, merciful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent Father who cares for His children. This is why your doctrine of God is showing good or bad. You made a decision this morning. We're thankful you made the decision to get dressed and come here. And I have had, there's been times in the past, I can think of one that comes to my mind immediately, is back at our church in Indianapolis, my wife, Danelle, was out of town, and I came to church, and you could tell Danelle was out of town because of what I was told when I arrived at church. The context is, I shave my head every morning, and apparently, after I did that, I did not successfully remove all the shave cream from the back of my head. And I'm not one, as my wife sometimes reminds me, it wouldn't hurt you to sometimes every now and then check the mirror, uh, to check the mirror. And I arrived on the property at the church, and one of the guys, I remember his name as if it was yesterday, he said to me, hey, Eric, uh, you got some shave cream here. And, and thankfully, he told me this at like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, not like 1230 in the afternoon, right? I'd spend three hours with everybody else, and no one you know, had been a friend to me. I came into public believing I was presenting myself as ready to be seen by others. You know, we typically clean ourselves up, put on an outfit, fix our hair, or take it off, <laughs> brush our teeth, put on something that makes us smell presentable. We go public. And depending on how well you've prepared yourself depends on how well you get ready to present yourself. So understand, we do this every day. Some of us can maybe use a bit more attention than others, myself included. This is what it's like with our theology. You maybe think you have prepared yourself. 
You've, you've got a few verses. You've got a few sermons. You maybe have read a few books. You've gone to church a few times. You think you are ready to be presented as, I believe in God. And then you go public. And then you find out when you get in public, ooh, I'm not sure you're ready. Now, the solution is not to not go in public. The solution is to realize there's beliefs about God that are still greatly missing in your understanding of Him as determined and revealed by the things you say or by the things you don't say, meaning maybe not even prayer, by your perspectives, by your counsel. This is why, friends, I said to you last week that we studied the character of God for four and a half months, all the attributes of which by no means did we exhaust one of them, let alone all of them, but yet with enough intention that then you might not just say, what an amazing God. But then, as I said last week, let's put that theology with some street clothes on. So when God, when Jesus, who is God, says your heavenly father knows, that should be rich to you as a statement. That should be like, ding, I know what that's talking about. I, I, I know him as father, as I've learned him, not as I've experienced my earthly father, good or bad, it's a lottery, but as I know him and who he is, that is meaningful to me. So when Jesus says, God knows what you need, that is a comfort to you. Number six, God wants your priorities to be right. Look at verse 33. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What's he talking about here? God is offering you more than just mere food and clothing. He is offering you himself, his kingdom. I, I see you, I hear you, I know you, and I'm granting you what you sometimes are missing is right in front of you. Me. Rather than focusing on the needs and the desires in life, which are certainly understandable, we are to focus on God and His kingdom, His righteousness. Now let me understand, explain this to you so that you would understand. Christians, listen to me. You are to pursue God and His kingdom. When it says as first, it does not mean first in time, but first in importance. It isn't like if you woke up and you talked to anything to God about anything before you did anything, up, oh, foul on the play. That's not what he's saying. It isn't like, you know, the first prayer request you got to say, the first thing you got to think, the first thing you try to do when you get up is that. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that is your greatest drive. That is your greatest desire. The kingdom of God should not be among many competing aims for you as a Christian. And Jesus is saying here that our desire as Christians is that our desire is to be directed towards the Lord, His work not just first and foremost personal needs. As I said last week, this isn't some pie in the sky. Like you just love God, you're going to kind of like namaste through life. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible calls us to responsibility. It calls us to provision. It calls us to industry. It calls us to these things. And it even says, bring these to the Lord in prayer. But to do so as an order of connection as to what is of greater desire. God wants us to get our priorities straight. When you see the word rendered here, given, it's more literally could be the word added. The things in question will be added to what the disciples already have. Think of it like this, Psalm 37, 4. We have it for you here on the screen. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, let me be clear, or let you be clear, and understand this is not a genie in the bottle verse. So just to be clear, I read a little Bible, do a little good works, and I get what I want. That's what it's saying. That's not what it's saying, as it's meant. What it's saying is someone who delights themselves in the Lord, someone who is in his word, in prayer, interacting and bringing their desires, their affections, their relationships, their, their instincts to the Lord, they're delighting in him. You know what the byproduct of that? Their desires change to be his desires. So often Christians are like basically, man, I want to know the will of God. I want to know the will of God. Do I, do I buy this car? Do I go to this school? Do I take this major? Do I date this girl? Do I date this guy? What, what, what do I do? 
Here's the, here's the simple answer. Delight yourself in the Lord and do whatever you want. Now, that sounds reckless, Pastor. Well, to be clear, God gives us freedom in Christ in light of the decreed will of God and the revealed will of God to obey Him and to pursue Him in various ways, and there's freedom. It does not mean there's not areas of wisdom or foolishness that we can learn from, but the idea here is, is that you want to delight in the Lord and have the corresponding freedom that comes from that and the decisions to make after that. Number seven, Jesus says, you can't change what might come tomorrow. You can't change what might come tomorrow. Let me just look back at verse 34. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be worried about it. Why? Or tomorrow will be anxious or worried for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Here's what I want you to understand. God gives you the grace you need each day. God does not promise grace today for tomorrow's problems. Friends, remember that. God does not promise grace today for tomorrow's problems. When tomorrow comes, he'll give you grace for that. You just deal with today. You just deal with today. Because after all, tomorrow might not come. It might not come. If it does, we will receive what is necessary from the Lord to deal with tomorrow's problems. God wants us to focus on what he is calling us to today. Now, I am admittedly concerned as I've been processing this message, thinking about, okay, how am I going to teach all this? I originally thought two sermons, just to warn you, I'm already up to three. Like, man, just land the plane, Pastor. Oh, no. Oh, no. I want you to get your money's worth. My concern is that you might be like, all right, got my bearings, Matthew 6. Jesus says it's right there. I mean, he's just literally, the pastor's copy and pasting it. He's not saying anything novel. Just boom, right there. Tell me what to do now. The scripture is helpful in this regards. We're going to talk about that. But, but here is my concern to transition too quickly from some quick truths from God's word, getting to some practical things to remember or do. And God's word does give you some very practical things to think and do. But there be, can be a crucial missing peace in all of this. And it's back to what I said last week in Matthew 6. Notice the context. What's the context in Matthew 6? Meaning, what's going on around there? Well, he's talking to the crowd, same conversation. He says, this issue in verse 19 about treasures. Treasures on earth versus treasures in heaven. Earth, verse 19, heaven, verse 20. And he, and he makes this comment in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So right now, I want you to ask yourself this question. What do I treasure? Saying it differently, what is of greatest value to me? I'm just going to literally like give you a Jeopardy moment of reflection without the... Da, na, na, na. You answer yourself right now in your mind. What do I treasure? What is of greatest value to me? You got it? I referenced last week uh, an image that David Pallison and a little CC of booklet writes about, and I actually want to give you the whole quote because I want you to understand the connection to anxiety here and treasure. He says the following. Think of it this way. Anxiety is like the red light flashing on your car's dashboard. When the check engine light goes on, you know something is wrong with your car. You don't know exactly what's wrong, but you do know that it's time to visit the mechanic. Would you want to drive without those lights to warn you of an engine problem? Probably not. 
It's better to take care of car trouble before you break down on the open road, end quote. Anxiety in your life and my life is that. It's the warning light on the dashboard of our hearts. Something's wrong. Saying it differently, and perhaps maybe a bit provocatively, anxiety, if you tracked on thinking, is actually a gift from God. Not the consequences it brings, but the indication that it's pointing to. It's telling us things are off. Let me ask you a question. How often do you get the oil in your car changed? I imagine some of you are like responsible car owners. Depending on the model and the make and the year, you know, it's 3,000 miles, it's 5,000 miles. Some of you, maybe you've got fancy cars, 10,000 miles. Others of you are like, I have no clue. And you know that because you've ruined an engine or two. Because why? Because you ran that car so hard without taking it in to get an oil change that it wasn't just bad oil, it became no oil. How many miles have you put on your heart before you've changed the spiritual oil? Ladies, forgive me. Let's talk about manicures. How often do you get your nails done? After a while, right, that polish gets chipped and you're like, man, we got to deal with that. How long do you go? So you're like, I haven't had a pedicure in years, manicure in years. Look, Eric doesn't even know what a manicure and pedicure is. What am I trying to say? What I'm saying is when you have anxiety alarms going off in your life, it's often indication that there is something in your life that has gone amiss. What you are treasuring, what is of greatest value to you is actually showing an alarm that you are becoming worried, you're becoming fearful, you're becoming doubtful, you're becoming distrustful, you're becoming overly concerned in a fearful way about something that could or maybe has or maybe might happen and as a result of that you have shifted. I am proposing, because God is proposing, that you sub out your answer to the question, what do I treasure? What is of greatest value to me? With whatever you answered a few minutes ago in your mind, I am proposing you sub that out with Jesus. Now, lest you think that sounds like preacher talk that works on a Sunday sermon, but it's not going to work when I get home this afternoon, and especially this week, I receive that. But now, let's do me a favor, if you don't mind. I want us to listen in on a dinner conversation that I think has everything to do with this conversation. So if you would, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. If you're not familiar with the Bible, if you found your way into the book of Matthew, it's just to the right. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 7. context, so you understand the scene, is that Jesus is at a dinner as a guest. It says in verse 36 of Luke 7, one of the Pharisees, this is the religious elite, the Jewish religious elite, asked him, Jesus, to eat with him, and he, Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So just understand, you've got low table, first century, middle, low ground table. They all, this is how they sit. They don't sit on chairs. They lay down and their heads are towards the table. Their feet are in the back part. So just picture like all the heads towards the center of the table with all their legs behind. They're not sitting on their legs. They're not sitting on chairs. They're laying in such a way that they can reach the food. They can all see each other. That's what's happening. Verse 37, behold, a woman of the city, that's not a compliment, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, standing behind him at his feet, weeping, 
she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. You got tears, you got hair, you got kisses, you've got exotic alabaster flask of ointment. The whole room would have smelled like it. Verse 39. Now, and the Pharisee who invited him saw this. He said to himself, so he's thinking this, he's not saying, he said this to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Notice the contrast. He apparently is not, she is. <laughs> I love it. Jesus, as a display of his divinity, by the way, did not hear the words, he knew the thought. Verse 40, Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He answered, say it, teacher. Buckle up, here we go. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, this is not Simon the disciple, this is the Pharisee who's a host of the house. Do you see this woman? Of course he sees the woman. He's been talking about her in his own heart. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Why in the world am I talking about this text on a sermon on anxiety? Here's why. Because anxiety is an alarm that your treasure, your security, your peace, your confidence, your hope has shifted from where it should be to something else. Where should it be? It should be on Jesus. Like, what, 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 what does it mean to be on Jesus? It means to recognize that your greatest concern, your greatest, greatest, greatest concern is not the results of the cancer treatment tomorrow morning when you go in the doctor's office. That's a prayer worthy request. It's not, will I have, sadly, with tears running down my cheeks, a safe pregnancy, or will I experience my third consecutive miscarriage? It's not, I'm 39 years old and I do not have any prospects at marriage. Will I die single? It's not, will my boss yet again use me and abuse me and pass over me and not promote me to what I think I'm rightly deserved? Meanwhile, he picks his friends to whom he goes to strip clubs with who don't do near the work that I do. It's not saying God does not see that or hear that. 
It's not saying God doesn't have an opinion about that, but your greatest need is not those things. Your greatest need is, how can my sins be forgiven? And if I have found the answer to that, it reorients everything. Everything. Because it tells me God sees me and knows my greatest problem is not what I see clearly, but what he sees honestly and has provided for it in nothing less than the death of his son. When Jesus is saying this about the, the woman, <laughs> she has given up reputation. Boy, are we anxious about our reputation. She has given up her possessions. This ointment, even the disciples say in another parallel text, uh, we could have fed a lot of poor people with this. She's given up her financial security of her future. She's given up her dignity. She is wiping the man's feet with her hair. She could care less. She is taking everything she has and she's like, Jesus, it's yours. It's yours. Why? Because you have forgiven me. You have loved me. There's no way someone like me would be accepted except through you. Dear Christian, for those of you who have understood this and put your faith in Christ, can I just briefly, but I hope helpfully, remind you of what you have as you still make prayer requests. And dear friends, I do the exact same thing as well. And you still have concerns and questions about the future, and I have mine as well. Can I please yet still remind you, dear Christian, because of Jesus, you have been forgiven, adopted, been given a new heart, had your future secured, had God's wrath removed, been put into an eternal caring family, brothers and sisters, fellow adopted children, been given the Holy Spirit, the third member of the triune Godhead, as a promise of your inheritance that will not be taken away, and also to serve as a comforter and a teacher. You have purpose in life for the first time. You know why you exist. You have freedom from guilt. No matter how much you're tempted to think you do not, it is, you are free. You have freedom from the power of sin. You can actually say no by God's enabling grace. You have peace that passes all understanding, hope that's above daily circumstances, fear of your future that's been removed, spiritual gifts given to you so you can build up the body and serve others, not just yourself, confidence that your heavenly father will never abandon you, never change his mind with you, like many, many of your earthly parents have done, never to be seen again. You have assurance that you will not lose your salvation. Why? And friends, I put a verse up for this one because some of you struggle with this issue of assurance of salvation because your confidence in your future is not in you being good enough. <laughs> it's Jesus being good enough. Because look at what it says here. Jesus, look at what Jesus says in John chapter six. This is the will of him who sent me, referring to God the Father, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. He's talking about the people that he came to save. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will, not might, not hope, I will raise him up on the last day. In Jesus, you have eternal life in perfect fellowship with God, joined by his people. I promise you, friends, I promise you, that, that was 17 of what I could give 47 things. That was, I promise you, if you and I would think more on those things, it would start to pour water on the fires of anxiety that burn hot in our heart. Will we fear that God does not see or God does not care? That Satan is more sovereign than God is? Christian, if you don't regularly think about and meditate on the fact that Jesus paid for your sins, you will not love Jesus that much. You will struggle with loving others and your heart will start having greater treasures than Jesus. And you will live a life of anxiety. I know it because I'm tempted the same way you're tempted. Preachers and pastors are not exempt from this. Every single one of us is, is tempted this way.
All right. I'm like editing in my mind right now. Friends, let me be clear. If you're not in Christ, and by that phrase, it's a biblical phrase, that means if you do not have a point in your life where you can say with complete transparency before the Lord, you can lie to us, we can be fooled, before the Lord, if you cannot say that I have seen myself for who I am, a rebel against God, and I've seen Jesus for who he is, the only substitute who's accomplished righteousness that I have any hope to be forgiven of my sin. And if you cannot think of a time when you have truly surrendered your life to Christ and say, forgive me, then you, my friend, hear me, have more reason to be anxious than you currently are right now. More reason to be anxious than you are right now. You should fear tomorrow, for tomorrow may never come. And to die without peace with God is to pay for an eternity for rejecting the Son. Jesus is clear on that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So for those of you to whom that applies, dear friends, I'm calling you with all of the compassion and passion in my heart. As was said to me, so I say to you, find in Jesus a Savior. For those of you who have, friend, remind yourself, remind each other as siblings in Christ of what a Savior we have. And you will begin to marvel again at your Savior if you have a level of honesty about your own sinfulness that he has forgiven. You can be like the Pharisee, little, or it can be like the woman who's a prostitute, a lot. The greater the sin forgiven, the greater the savor that's accomplished that forgiveness. And for you as a Christian, be reminded in the songs you've sung, the prayers we've prayed, the scripture we've read, and the sermon you're hearing now, what a savior whom we treasure and has promised to be with us to the end of the age.